Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Everyone, and welcome to episode 235 of the Mom Hour. I'm Sarah Powers here as always with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. How are you doing? I am great. Um, we are talking today about a couple of different things inspired by a question we got from listener Aaron. We're going to be talking about the concept of mom brain. You may be familiar with that kind of <laughs> <laughs> fuzzy feeling that you can't Just quite keep it all together. A little, yeah. yeah. And I want to point out that we very rarely take a question and do a whole episode about it, but this one just sparked so many different topics that we potentially, you know, rabbit holes we saw ourselves kind of going down. Yeah. And so it was we're really a, grateful. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Erin. And I'm going to read her question in just a minute, but it was very thoughtfully posed. And, and yeah, like you said, Megan, sometimes a question is, something we can quickly tackle and kind of give some quick tips and advice. And other times it even makes, makes us think. So we're going to talk about kind of that mom brain phenomenon and then also expanding from there, what it means to have adult conversations when you are a mom and how it's really easy to get out of practice. You know, we're going to be going into the holidays pretty soon here. Um, And sometimes I think as moms, we can feel a little self-conscious if we haven't, if we've been hanging out with preschoolers for days on end. Um, And so we just are here to validate that and maybe offer some, some thoughts so that you can go into your holiday gatherings, feeling like a great conversationalist, because we've, we really think most of you are, we haven't even had a conversation with you, but we believe it's in you. We believe it. Yes. (laughs) Well, I want to read Aaron's question before we go to our break so I can kind of set the stage here. And I also have to laugh a little bit because Aaron is, as she says in her message, she just had her fourth baby and she has four children, six and under, and is wondering why she feels like she has mom brain. So I think we can all just say, Aaron, you should, if you didn't have mom brain right now, that would be weird. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. It so would. Aaron wrote to us and said, do you feel like you suffered more from mom brain when your kids were really little? Or do you feel like you suffer from it as much now as you ever did? And Aaron defines mom brain as general distraction, inability to focus on one task for very long and unusual forgetfulness, all of which I can relate yeah. to on a daily basis. So she says, to give you a picture of my stage right now, my kids are six, four, two, and two months. My days are made up of nursing, diapering, swaddling a newborn, redirecting and calming a very strong-willed two-year-old, keeping track of when my four-year-old last went potty as she's been going through a potty regression, attempting to make dinners that everyone will eat, almost always failing, etc. Though we're out of the very newborn phase and have settled somewhat into a routine since my son was born in August, my capacity for engaging in normal adult conversation and keeping track of things like current events is at an all-time low. With the holidays coming up, I'm both looking forward to seeing my family and catching up with people and also recognizing that my day-to-day life looks very different from that of my siblings and in-laws. I don't think what I'm doing at this stage of my life is any less valid than anything that any of my relatives is doing. And I like to ask questions and hear what they're all up to, but sometimes I feel like I don't have much to offer in response. I would love to hear your thoughts on mom brain and how to deal with it gracefully. I love being a mom and I'm happy to be in this stage right now. 
I sometimes just cannot believe how things can so easily slip my mind that never would have before I had kids. Sincerely, Aaron. Well, Aaron, I can believe it. I know, me too. (laughs) Everything you just described is chaos. And it's so much to juggle and keep track of. And I think it's clear from how articulate your email is that when you sit down and have a moment to, even if you didn't have a moment to focus, like even if you were writing this on the go, you can focus your brain and you are a good conversationalist. It's just that your, your days are sort of this whirlwind of activity and so many things to keep track of. So just to validate you a little bit, um, that this is very, very normal and you, I'm sure we'll have a lot more to add to the conversation than you think. And I also just want to kind of compliment. It's, it's very um, sort of forward thinking to even recognize that we're going into this holiday season where we're in mixed company more often. Yes. I think I probably wouldn't have even foreseen that and just ended up in conversations where I'm awkwardly like not able to talk about what I've been doing lately. <laughs> right. So I yes. think it's, um, Aaron, I think you sound really smart and intelligent and wise. And so we're excited to tackle this topic. Um, and we will get to that right after the break. Sarah, you know, when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. We are welcoming back Dr. Mom Butt Balm as a sponsor today. And Megan, I guess you must be back to changing diapers again, right? Now that you have a step grandbaby in the mix. I have changed a few lately, Sarah. And yeah, it really takes me back to that memory from early motherhood. I actually always enjoyed diaper changes unless they were the really gross toddler ones or if there was diaper rash involved. Oh my gosh, yes. I remember being so stressed out, like gearing up for the saddest diaper change ever. Your baby knows it's going to hurt. You know they're going to cry. It is just the worst. And having to use goopy, gross diaper rash cream definitely didn't help. Dr. Mom Butt Balm was developed by a mom who's also a doctor when she couldn't find any traditional products that worked for her baby's persistent diaper rash. This pediatrician-approved formula is made with all quality ingredients and no artificial dyes or preservatives. And since it's easy to remove, you won't have to wipe and wipe to get it off of your baby's skin. That is so important, especially if they're already a little chafed. And I love the way this formula feels. A little goes a long way. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Okay, so Megan, let's tackle this idea of mom brain first. And I just want to ask you, do you remember this fuzzy, like forgetful feeling? And was it specific to the newborn stage as Aaron asked, or did it ebb and flow through different stages of motherhood? Well, from what I can remember, because there's two (laughs) kinds of mom brain, there's like the mom brain that happens while it's happening. And then there's that amnesia that happens later. Um, but mine was very strangely cyclical. Um, but predictably, like as I had more kids, I started to realize it. So I was like mentally useless for the last probably three weeks of pregnancy because I was obsessed with getting the baby out. Like that's all I could think (laughs) about. And I was writing and all that stuff for three of those pregnancies, but I got to the end. It was just like, I was so, it wasn't even just fog. It was utter distraction. Like all I could think about was having a baby. And so everything else was just like sidetracked and I had a really hard time focusing. And then after baby came along and this happened all five times, I had this real moment of mental clarity and a rush of energy that would last me like six to eight weeks. And then I would crash. Mm -hmm. And I actually think it was kind of probably like a hormone shift, sleep deprivation, catching up with Mm me, um, sleep deprivation actually increasing because I was pretty good about getting a lot of sleep, like in the early days. Mm -hmm. And then I think I became worse and worse about it as, um, 
even as the baby's sleep schedule evened out, I would get kind of a bravado around it mm-hmm. and not feel like I carved that time out for myself. And so I really started to lean into that hard where I, by the time I got around to being pregnant with Owen and Clara, I just knew like the last three weeks of my pregnancy, I would stare at a wall <laughs> and do nothing. Um, and then that I would work really hard in the first like six weeks because I knew that crash was coming. I remember when Clara was in the NICU for 10 days, like I was meeting deadlines and getting so much work done because I just knew like I had an opportunity. (laughs) She was sleeping a lot and I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm in this chair anyway. So I'm going to get a bunch of work done. And that was my cycle. Um, it has changed now. I'm curious how, how about for you? Yeah. I mean, for me, the forgetfulness or the fuzziness seemed directly related to lack of sleep. Um, Mm -hmm. and so I relate to what you were saying because I, I almost felt like the first couple of months were this survival mode and maybe it's because you have more help or people are a little more allowing, but I remember hitting a real wall around three or four months because two of my babies did not improve like newborns are supposed to do supposed to in quotes, but, um, they didn't really lengthen their nighttime stretches. Like I wanted them to. And so I was still dealing with like a newborn nighttime sleep schedule at three, four months. And I just remember that cumulative Mm. effect. I remember my eyes hurting that kind of fatigue and um, almost like a, like a malaise, like a lack of desire to (laughs) to do anything. Um, so that is more of a sleep deprivation mom brain. I would say once I was able to sleep that, um, my mental acuity (laughs) really improved. And I, I feel like what mom brain is for me now is a little bit more of a like distracted brain. So I Mm -hmm. am much more awake. I'm well caffeinated. I'm well rested. I exercise. Like I have this life now that supports like a pretty healthy, I'm like, I have energy because I am not in that survival anymore. What that means is I think my brain can be somewhat of a hamster wheel. I can be talking to the kids after school, doing dishes, thinking about the next thing, thinking about work. Like, so now to me, it feels more like a hamster brain, mom brain, very different from the fuzzy. And so, I mean, we get to call mom brain, whatever we want to call it. It's not a clinical, it's not a clinical diagnosis, but I feel it in a different way. Yeah. I, oh my gosh. When you said the thing about eyes hurting, (laughs) I mean, do you ever have a date? Like it rarely happens to me because I'm so fanatical about sleep that I will find, I will do anything I have to, to get enough sleep now. (laughs) Um, but there's been obviously every now and then I have a day where I just didn't sleep well or whatever. And I'm a little bit sleep deprived and it's almost like a panicky feeling when I start to feel my, my eyes do that thing where they like, they burn. Mm -hmm. Um, it feels like you're getting the flu. That's the only way I can really Hmm. describe it. And that feeling it's like, it just brings back that muscle memory of when I felt like that all the time. Yes. And oh, it's just like making me yes. tense up right now, just thinking about it. Um, like you, I mean, yeah, the hamster wheel brain. It's the thing that I think we talked about in a recent episode where you do that thing where sometimes your kids are talking to you and you trail off mm-hmm. or like yes. you go, uh, and you never answer their question because they can take the brunt of it because they're the neediest. Yep. Like they're, they're in our faces with these like sort of benign minor needs all the time. And they're things that we, we aren't prepared to deal with that need at that moment because we have something else on our minds and it's hard to shift. And that's definitely something for me. Um, another thing, and I don't know if this is an age thing or just how hard I'm running all day mentally, but by like eight o'clock, I start to run out of mental energy long before I run out of physical energy. And that didn't used to happen to me as much. I feel Hmm. like I used to just be tired all the time. Okay. And (laughs) yeah, now it's more like I hit a peak and then I can't really think so good anymore. Okay. And I don't really know. And so when I talk with people about time management, I remember having this conversation in my entrepreneur group recently where they were saying like, how do you perceive time? Do you perceive time as abundant? And I said, well, what's interesting is I think I have plenty of time to do all the things I want to do, could do, should do, but I don't have the brain power Mm. to do them all. So I find that I have to conserve energy, like mental energy in a way that I don't remember doing when I was younger, a younger mom. And I don't know why could be age. It could be just the fact that like now when I'm able to uh, concentrate, I go so hard. I was going to say that actually, because you are really, really like intense worker when you work in bursts. So it could literally, and you used to, you know, when you had little kids, your bursts were spaced out by like motherhood and kids stuff. But now you sometimes have days at a time where you could in theory, just go hard the whole time. So maybe it's just your body and your brain's natural, like, um, 
like a safety break, <laughs> you know, like, well, a safe- yeah. And I think there's something about having little kids that forces you to pace yourself in a weird way because you have to sit down right. at some point, the nursing baby, I mean, unless yeah. you have figured out how to do that while vacuuming, um, and like, I don't know, doing the laundry, like you, you're going to have to sit mm-hmm. at some point, you're going to have to like be quiet. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just a very different kind of energy. So it's exhausting, totally exhausting. And I'm not downplaying that at all, but there's a different rhythm. Yes. To the energy. Yeah. I want to say one more thing about mom brain, because I think Erin alluded to it um, in just an offhand way in her email about feeling unprepared to talk about current events. And I definitely remember this isn't doesn't have to do with a fuzziness or fogginess or forgetfulness, but I have definitely had entire years or blocks of time in my life where my world was very uh, self-contained in the four walls of my house. And my current events involved like tantrums and bedtimes. And I knew that I was being a little bit willfully ignorant of what was going on in the, in the outer world. And luckily my husband's really clued in. And sometimes I'd kind of, he'd catch me up and, and then sometimes it would just make me anxious and I'd kind of tune out again. And so if it helps to hear this from someone who's farther along, I now think I have a fairly healthy relationship with current events. Like I enjoy staying informed I'm able to keep the anxiety at bay most of the time. um, And I'm able to talk about it with my husband and even my kids. And, but like that took a long time of, of either not being able to, or not being able to care. Like I can't care about that right now because everything I'm doing is like so micro in front of me. So just to offer that. um, I, I like that. And just to add one more thing to that, I still am in a place where I'm not as engaged. I don't think even as you are, Sarah, and I know you've gone out of your way to to choose media very carefully that will kind of keep you like informed. Um, For me, I tend to do deep dives into one thing and then know nothing about anything else. So like I might know a lot about a local political race, Mm -hmm. but not very much about what's happening nationally. I've decided I can't care about the primaries. Like I just can't. Yeah. (laughs) Well, because I'm not going to be someone who enacts change on that level or whatever. So like, it's not, I'm just, I don't care. I can't, I can't care about it. So one Um, thing I think really quick is that we're going to talk in a minute about being an interesting conversationalist. And I think that's one of the things that makes you a fantastic conversationalist is because when you have gone on a deep dive, like you can provide really in-depth, interesting insight into something that if you just skimmed all the headlines every day, you wouldn't be able to. So I think that's, I think that's an asset. Oh, that's interesting. And what I was going to say (laughs) is that I think you can know nothing about anything and still be a good conversationalist Mm -hmm. because everybody has things that they share. And we'll get into this uh, tips around this pretty soon. But everybody has shared experiences, um, no matter how uh, like you might not be the one reading all the books or watching the shows that all the people are seem to be talking about. But you have something in your in your tool chest. I was going to say toy box um, (laughs) that you can pull out that would make for interesting conversation. So it doesn't have like, just because there's party conversation that everyone reverts to doesn't mean you have to engage in that. And sometimes I actually think it's better and more interesting not to. I agree. I totally agree. Well, then let's talk about this difference between mom brain, which is the fuzziness, the forgetfulness, or the just, I can't care about anything that's not right in front of my face right now. And then this bigger topic of I don't know if we, it's like being out of practice with adult conversation. Um, And it's this thing that happens when we just don't have, we don't log as much time in conversation with other grownups. And so we get to Aaron's position where we feel like, I I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know what everyone's talking about. I haven't seen a movie in eight years. Um, So I'll just offer, I think these are definitely two different things, but that you could experience both of them at the same time. You could be feeling very sleep deprived and distract, distracted and mom brainish and also out of practice in conversation. Or you could experience one of these things without the other. And I definitely have in my life experienced both separately. So for me, the mom brain feels like more something I experience almost in my own home with my own family. Like you talked about, Megan, the trailing yeah. off when, when your kids are like, mom, you didn't even finish that sentence or, right. you know, overbooking myself or getting like all messed up with my own schedule. That mom brain stuff feels more hyper local to my house. Whereas the adult conversation piece, I think can happen really at any stage of your life. And I almost think, I wonder if people who aren't moms or new parents experience this too, just because the way we consume and get and share information has become very isolating because it mostly happens on our devices um, that I wonder if everybody's conversation skills are getting rusty. I mean, I don't, I don't know that, but it seems like it could be true. I think you're totally right. And I think it also depends who you're with. So if you, you know, if Aaron was with another group of, of moms with like little kids, 
there's almost like a shorthand that you can refer to, like you can revert to um, where you don't have to work very hard because you're all speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. It's really when you end up around people who aren't speaking that same language that you have to work and it becomes, it can become kind of awkward. And then add into that the fact that you probably haven't been able to get through a conversation without being interrupted in years now. Um, That can make it feel like when was the last time I like, oh, when was the last time I sat and actually talked to someone for 10 to 15 minutes without anyone tugging on my hand or climbing in my lap or trying to pull my boob out of my shirt. Like (laughs) really, when was that time? And and if you can't remember, that's like just another layer, like another obstacle on top of the fact that it's hard for all of us. Yeah. 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 No, totally agree. Okay. Well, let's talk about small talk, which is this kind of like, (laughs) it's going to happen. (laughs) It's going to happen. Like if we want to get back to having adult conversations at some point, the small talk has to happen. I think small talk sometimes gets like an extra bad rap. So I want to know, like, is it a necessary evil? Is it just evil? Is it necessary, (laughs) but okay. Like, what are your thoughts on small talk? Okay. So here's the thing about small talk. Um, I think small talk done well is an art form. It's not one I'm very good at. Um, I will either kind of awkwardly stand there and not talk to you at all, um, or you will know my life story within the first 10 minutes of knowing <laughs> me. And that's because I don't know what to do with small talk. And I'm not talking like talking about the weather. I can talk about the weather with the guy that was checking me out at the store. I don't mean checking me out because that <laughs> conversation's going somewhere else, if you know what I mean. But those, those um, interactions I'm fine with because I understand the rules of engagement. Mm-hmm. I go up with my milk. Uh, the person asks me how I am. I make funny comment about whether I pay, I leave like done. Right. It's more of those. Like, you know, you kind of have to engage someone a little bit more, um, but you, you're you looking for that meaty thing to connect with. And as soon as I find it, I can relax and be really and speak really freely. But the minutes before I get into it are very uncomfortable for me. And then when I know I'm not going to have time to get to it, like, for example, if I'm at the grocery store, but I see someone I kind of know in the produce mm-hmm. aisle, I just want to run away because that's like the ultimate middle ground. We're not going to get to anything meaty. Yeah. I don't know them well enough to just kind of give them a hug and go on with my life. And there's no there's no rules of engagement. There's well, no there's, interaction. Yeah, and there's no stopping point. Like there's no like right. natural place. Like with the <laughs> checkout example, you're going to, there's someone else in line behind you. Like you right. have to leave. Have you ever noticed on airplanes, like most people, there's always the chatty ones, but most people don't talk to each other until you're in your descent. And yeah. then people open up because you know, you're getting off the plane soon. So this is right. like a 10 to 12 minute conversation that's going to end, but you yep. don't start that conversation at takeoff because there's no way out and you don't know like the type of conversation you're getting into. I always find exactly. that so funny. It is funny. And sometimes I will, but like, I'll have my earbuds already in my hand. Like I have yeah. like a, I have like a, like a, like a strategy around it that I didn't create on purpose. It just, I'm like, okay, my earbuds are almost in my ears. I can say a couple niceties Uh and truly niceties, not asking them anything about themselves, but like, you know, here, let me move my purse over more or whatever. And then my earbuds are in and and that's just a way of protecting my space. So I don't have to do that. Um, I have actually been the person though, who's gotten into long, deep conversations on airplanes with people. It just depends on my mood. Um, But anyway, I do think small talk is really important to our social fabric. There's been some studies done about this and some really um, interesting articles that I've read recently that kind of made me kind of get over a little bit my aversion to small talk. And I've tried to get more comfortable with it to, with some success. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say I'm great at it. I think maybe I'm just more comfortable with the fact that my small talk is going to look like weird little snippets of big talk. Yeah. I love that. I love that. That's actually like a great way to think about it. Um, yeah. Well, so I don't actually mind small talk and it does, it does get a bad rap or that's, you know, people love to say how much they hate small talk. And I understand why. Um, I actually really enjoy meeting new people. Um, and I don't mind the kind of small talk that happens. Like say, if you're mixing at a social gathering or you're meeting someone for the first time, especially if it's a mutual acquaintance, it's like, you're not a stranger off the street, but somebody that you would, you're in the same room for a reason, or say we're networking at a conference or whatever. Mm. Um, I really enjoy hearing about people's jobs and their lives in the city where they live. I, I, I often have a lot of questions because I, that's just the type of conversationalist I am. The part of small talk I don't enjoy is I think maybe I'm coming at this the same way you are about the, the produce aisle. I don't enjoy small talk with people who I have been acquainted with for long enough where I feel like we should be past this. So for example, like 
a group of moms from school or maybe neighbors, although I feel like my neighbors and I have great neighbors, so we're past small talk, but these types of um, sort of circumstantial relationships where you just keep having the same small talk conversations yes. over and over again. Those are the ones I find myself not looking forward to, or even avoiding, like you said in the, in the grocery store. And that's what I'm not even sure what the answer is for those types of relationships. But I guess I see a big difference between getting to know you small talk or even sitting next to somebody on an airplane, small talk, like that kind of thing doesn't bother me because I find it genuinely interesting to learn new things about someone new. It's the repeated, like, where yes. are you going for the holidays? How you are the holidays? Yeah. Like, or you've already answered this a million times. Yeah. 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 And I feel like people aren't very good listeners when you make yes. those kinds of, because it's almost like a checklist. Like I should ask about the holidays. I should ask about how the kids are doing. Um, and that feels weary, wearis- wearisome. Is that the right word? That feels wearying to so, me. That is a word, yeah. I believe. Yes. Yeah. Not to be, not to be confused with worrisome. Yeah. Which is a different <laughs> word, right? Yeah. I mean, where I think a lot of times that goes is work. And I know that you and I both share that we find it very awkward to talk about our work <laughs> with people who aren't in this world, because it's kind of like you have to re you have to explain what it is we do over and over and over. What I think is really interesting is that now people who've known me for, you know, maybe five years plus Uh will often start a conversation. So we're we're talking about acquaintances, people that I don't spend tons of time with or know super well, but that I know well enough that I feel like we should be past this. Yeah. um, But who've also known me long enough to see my career go through a few different incarnations. Mm -hmm. They'll make it even more awkward because they'll say, so are you still blogging? Yeah. (laughs) And I'm like, well, I'm podcasting. They'll be like, oh, right. Podcasting. And then I think, do they know that I have a podcast? Do they think podcasting and blogging are the same because it happens on a, like, because there is an associated blog post. Do I need to explain this? And I I go through all these mental gymnastics of trying to figure out how much to say. I feel like it would be a lot easier if I had like a flower shop. Right. Yes. No, I, I totally still at that flower shop. Like like, (laughs) you can see my name on the, yeah. I mean, if you're not doctor, nurse, lawyer, teacher, you know, like one of the yes. things that engineer maybe. Um, so many jobs are hard to explain in casual conversation, either to someone new or like I've definitely experienced that where I've known someone for a while and I know that they don't really know what I do at all, but it's like too late to ask and too awkward to talk right. about. So um, yes, I feel the same. And I've tried to get better about uh, just my, not. it's not an elevator pitch necessarily, but like the succinct answer to the question, what do you do? But I also, because I work from home and I pick my kids up right after school, I have a lot of people who assume I'm a fully stay at home mom and don't ask at all. And then that can be awkward because it's not really the case. So, right. And sometimes they assume you're available for stuff you're not or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another thing about that, that's funny when I was at the, on the radio for a couple of years, it in some ways was a relief because then people could place me and they'd be like, oh, right, you're on that radio mm-hmm. show. And I was like, uh-huh. And part of me is like, yeah, but I have this whole other business that I do that you know nothing about. But it was mostly easier just to not talk about that and just go with the radio because it made sense to people. Yeah. Now that I'm not on the radio, people will say, oh, what are you doing now? And then I want to be like, no, I was doing this the whole, like yeah. the radio was a side thing. It was nothing like it was fun, but it really didn't compare at all to this other stuff I'm doing that I was doing the entire time and and have been doing in some form or another for many, many years that you know nothing about. So I feel like I'm constantly having to like almost not prove myself, but it's like, I think maybe because of the way we are with our work, it's not the same as going and punching a clock Mm -hmm. and like, you know, working in a factory or something. We're very personally connected to our work. And so I feel like I have to say it the right way to like, define myself almost. Mm-hmm. And that's on me. Like I need to get over that and just come up with a couple of easy things to say. Like yeah. I have a podcast. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Yeah. No, I, I have words. said, yeah, the end. <laughs> um, yep. So I'm actually thinking of how this relates back to Aaron. And I think this is actually good news for someone in Aaron's position, because what we've learned here is nobody pays attention to what anyone has been up to <laughs> ever. So like even yes. your friends who are out there in the working world or building yeah. careers or like have on the surface or on paper, these more dynamic, interesting lives, they don't, they are not paying attention to you being in like the throes of four little kids, but nor are they really paying attention to what their other brothers-in-law or cousins have been up to. Like everyone is coming into say a holiday gathering, pretty checked out at what everybody else has been up to. And so 
yes, that involves some awkward small talk with like, so yeah. what have you been doing lately? And I, th- I know there's, it can be hard when you're a stay at home mom to answer that question in a way that's not going to elicit some kind of either obnoxious or clueless or awkward response from the person you're yes. talking to. I've actually, I've also had people gush about the importance of stay at home motherhood. Like I was doing yes, something too, like too much. Yes. Where it was <laughs> yes. like, okay, I get it. Like, so anyway, um, it's not to solve it, but it maybe is to say that everyone's on a little bit more of an even playing field, maybe than you think Aaron coming mm-hmm. into these holiday gatherings. Totally agree. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar, they have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them, and I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution, Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. All right, Megan, let's dive in a little bit deeper into this, this worry or this insecurity that when you're a mom of littles, you maybe don't have as much to offer, or don't have as much interesting conversation yeah. mojo going on. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, two things popped into my head um, in, in different. And this is both as a new mom and a mom with older kids where I'm not really talking about mom stuff as much. Um, I have found myself both in a situation where, where I'm around really nice, friendly people. And I feel really left out. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side about being around people who I think should be interesting, but I'm really bored. (laughs) And I try to figure out like what the common thread is. And it's usually because there's a group of people who have a shared experience that I didn't have. And then those people didn't like work to bring me into that conversation, Mm -hmm. or I didn't know how to insert myself into Mm -hmm. that conversation. So what's interesting is when I was younger, um, I would, you know, I was always the one that had kids. And so I'd be out with like 30 year olds, people my age doing what people who are 30 who don't have kids tend to do, Mm -hmm. like go on really amazing trips and restaurants and stuff like that. And I had nothing to add to those conversations so they could feel really lonely and boring. Mm -hmm. And then I think if you flip that around and said, now there's a room full of moms Mm -hmm. and there's like one non-mom sitting there, she could feel really bored Mm -hmm. and lonely. So I think part of it, like being a good conversationalist is both including others when you're like the insider, Mm -hmm. but also figuring out a way to be included because that's the part that I think can be really hard. Like Mm -hmm. how do you make yourself relevant to a conversation that doesn't seem to have anything to do with you? Um, And I guess you have a couple of choices and I don't think there's anything wrong with any of these choices, but one of them is to zone out and not try. And Hey, listen, I've been there. (laughs) Like I have been there where I just go through the motions and I don't really work very hard to like insert myself. And it just doesn't sound like that's where Aaron is. Like, Mm -hmm. I feel like the question that Aaron's asking makes it sound like she would feel lonely if she did that. Um, So then I guess the other choice is like figure out a way to be an insider Mm -hmm. or to bring other people inside or to bring up a topic or find something to discuss that sort of removes that. Like we're all teachers over here and you're the one who's not a teacher or we're all moms, like almost like find the thing that everybody can talk about. And I think that takes practice and it takes a kind of willingness. Like you said, it's not the easy route. The easy route is to check out. And right. um, But yeah, it it kind of takes a a willingness to read the room and to maybe put yourself out there. Um, It takes some courage mm -hmm. in being the person who's not like everybody else and who doesn't know what everyone else knows too. And I think that can be hard. Like, you know, especially if you're with people who are, who share a experience that you don't share, Yes, you might show your ignorance, but that's okay. Like no one, 
everyone's going to be okay with that. <laughs> well, here's one thing I think is interesting. We look for commonality and I, this is, I'm guilty of this. If I meet someone in a group setting that has something in common with me, I, that like lights me up in a way that meeting someone super different from me does. And I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. It's just either it's human nature or it's me. Then I want to be like, oh my gosh, like you grew up there. I grew up there. Let's compare all the notes, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I think it, the, the deeper and the richer conversations and experiences probably come from the opposite. They come from when you find the things that not everybody has in common or that you aren't the same, but that's a hard pattern to break because if you sit down and everyone is having a similar motherhood experience, that's what they're going to want to compare notes about. So it takes a, like, almost like a pushing upstream a little bit to get to the yeah. place where you're diversifying that, that conversation. So, yeah, well, agreed. Maybe let's offer some tips, especially going into the holiday season on if you do want to, you know, just challenge yourself to be an interesting conversationalist or kind of flex those muscles in a way that you have not before. And I just want to say we both believe that no matter what stage you're in or what how much work you're doing outside the home or inside the home, like everybody has the ability, I think, to be a great conversationalist. I would love to talk to any of our listeners. And you can draw on old material. Yeah. <laughs> I'll also say that and I'll dig into that later. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have to be fresh and new. Like it's going to be fresh and new to someone else. Yeah. So like you don't need to know what's going on yeah. in the world. You don't have to be. Yes. You don't have to have watched Game of Thrones. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, OK, well, my first tip um, is to ask questions and to be curious, because I think if you are feeling like you maybe don't have as many stories to tell or things to offer, or especially if you're kind of warming up to this idea of adult conversation, you can always use my line that I use with my kids, which is, wow, tell me more about that. People Mm -hmm. love to talk about themselves. They love to talk about their jobs and their travels. And if you can practice that active listening and genuinely, it's, it's funny. We talked about losing the, or being out of the habit of conversing, but you also get out of the habit of listening for longer than 30 seconds when you're, when you're in new motherhood. So for when when all the people saying things to you are like tiny and nothing, they say makes any sense. You stop listening. Yeah. And they switch topics (laughs) like every 14 seconds. So, um, Ask questions, listen curiously, and don't be afraid to ask another question or a follow-up question. I mean, I think there's a point at which that becomes annoying, but you're probably not at that point. I I doubt you're at that point. I <laughs> ask a lot of questions when I'm getting to know somebody, and it's genuinely fun for me to hear someone's perspective on something. And and then I'm not talking very much, but I'm keeping things going. So that's just one. Yeah. Tip. One of my favorite things to do when people are talking to me is to just kind of mentally, not like because I'm doing that thing where I'm waiting for them to stop talking so I can talk. But like, as they're talking, I'm kind of mentally putting myself in their shoes. Mm. And then I can say something like, oh, it seems like that would be X, Y, and Z, Mm -hmm. right? And then they have the opportunity just to agree or to deny Mm -hmm. what I've just said. And people really like to dig into their stuff. Like, like you said, people love to talk about themselves. They love um, a a follow up too. Maybe because we're interviewers, we, we do this more naturally, but I have noticed there's such a transactional nature to conversations these days that people don't expect, like I ask how you're doing, you tell me, then you're going to ask me the same thing that I'm going to tell you. And nobody asks a follow up ever. So when Mm -hmm. you do, when you say, wow, tell me more about that. Or like you said, that must've been really hard. Like, um, I think people are almost surprised because it's like, wait, I get to keep telling you this. So, yeah. And honestly, like we, we so often like revert to shorthand and code again. So like one of the things that we tend to say, and this, this could be anybody like you're talking to maybe not the checkout person because that is so fast, but someone you're going to spend some time with the hairstylist or like someone that you're spending a few minutes with your Uber driver. It's so, it's so common for them to ask you a question and for you to have this pat answer. Mm -hmm. And I think it's okay. Like that happens. Like everyone's busy, right? So if your hairstylist says, how you doing busy? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're going to say, yeah. But then it's like, then it gives you almost a chance to go, you know what? We all say we're busy, but yeah. And like almost flip it, this like flip the script a little bit. And then sometimes they'll also then be like, yeah, you're right. Everyone does say they're busy. What does that even mean? And then it leads into this conversation. Like almost anything can be, can be grounds for discussion because especially almost like the more trite and tropish it is, the more people will have to say about it Mm -hmm. because everyone notices um, that thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have found like those low stakes ways, like again, being in the Uber, although I tend to get into really deep conversations (laughs) with with my Uber driver. um, You don't have to, it could be like pointing out the most obvious thing ever and then let them tell you about it. Like, what is it like? What, when is the worst traffic? 
mm-hmm. in this city that I'm in right now? Or you're talking to your hairstylist, like what is like everyone trying to get their hair? Like how was the style right now? What's everyone doing? Let them tell you. And sometimes they'll just pull things out of you. Um, but I'm trying really hard because it's so easy to fall into those. I don't know, just those habitual responses to things that deserve a better response. Yeah. yeah. Well, and all of those, those places you mentioned are really good for practice. So if you have not been around a lot of adults lately, um, I think you can just sort of give yourself a little like challenge to be more yeah. intentional about those conversations and not give the pat response or give a little longer response. Or like you said, mm-hmm. ask them a question. Um, kind of related to that, I think it's also great practice to practice bringing people together in conversation, like pulling someone in if they are the one who's kind of left out, like you were talking about earlier, or changing the tone or changing the topic of a conversation to include people in a new way. That's, that's a talent that like, when you see someone, a host at a party or something, do that well, it's very admirable because it's, I think it's difficult, but I think if Mm -hmm. we're going into the holidays, wanting to feel included and wanting others to feel included, you can practice that. You can also practice that with kids of mixed ages too. Like we've talked before about how there's this expectation on kids to want to like sit and talk to grandma for a long time. And it can be hard, but as the mom, you have that superpower of knowing what's interesting to say the tween set and what the uncle might have to offer. And you can sort of be the architect of that of bringing those conversations together. So that's another thing I think to, to practice. I love that. And you know, that, that speaks to is that part of being a great conversationalist is knowing about other people. Mm -hmm. It's not about what you do necessarily, but if you know something about your cousin and how that relates to something that your sister is interested in or doing, like you've got a natural way to, to bring yourself in and be an important part of that conversation. And it doesn't have to be about you or what you're mm-hmm. doing, which can feel like a lot of pressure yeah. for me. I don't always like to talk about what I'm doing. Yeah. It actually makes me really uncomfortable sometimes. So to be able to talk about what other people are doing can, um, and like to have, to have the ability to do that because you're listening. Yes. <laughs> do you attention. remember the scene? Did you um, watch Bridget Jones's diary? The first movie? I did. Like, yeah. you know, what, what, I those, love the that movie. scene where she introduces, um, where she practices Everyone with introducing, a factoid? Yes. And yes, like, it goes like, terribly wrong. <laughs> yes. Like so-and-so. Yeah. I can't remember now what it is, but yes. It's like, well, I think when she's introduced to um, the Colin Firth character, isn't it that um, like Bridget used to run around naked in my naked paddling in the pool. Paddling, in the yeah. paddling pool. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. I forgot about that, but yeah, it can, it can go wrong, but you know, that's, that makes for good humor, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and speaking of like material to draw on, I mean, I will sometimes, if I'm at a conversation or at a party or something and I'm like losing my ability to focus <laughs> on what's happening or just don't have anything to add, or people are talking about, you know, some political race I don't know anything about or whatever. Like I will literally bring up eighties cartoons or like ad jingles. I remember from being a kid and the world is full of material. And sometimes it's just saying that dumb thing that's in your mind that when it pops into your head, like not interrupting someone else's conversation, Mm -hmm. that would be rude, but finding a way to work it in, in a fun way is like, can be really fun. And it can take you kind of down this, I don't know, rabbit hole of people, um, relating to each other that Mm -hmm. maybe don't have any other common ground. Like everyone can find common ground around certain things or most everyone. Um, maybe for maybe you couldn't, Sarah. <laughs> well, I mean, I can try. <laughs> you can try. That was, that's where Sarah's like awkwardly in the corner, not saying anything. Cause she has, no- you could look it up though. Yeah. You could always get out your phone. That's um, true. Another thing that I think is what I love to do when I'm talking to people, if I don't have a lot to add to a conversation or don't know what they're talking about, I will tell them to give me spoilers to a show. Now, I know that some people hate spoilers. <laughs> we learned recently that you love spoilers. It was I don't very care. shocking like, to me. Well, here's the thing. There are people who don't like spoilers for shows they're never going to watch. Oh, that's just not me. I don't care about that. Because it's a spoiler. And so to me, like, that's like a selfish way of like not allowing people to have a conversation about something that it doesn't matter to me. Like, I'm never going to watch that show. So, and sometimes people will give spoilers and I forget them because I don't watch the show for two years or whatever. So I will often be like, oh my gosh, tell me about it. It's okay. You can tell spoilers. I'm not going to watch it. 
just because like I can tell the people around me want to have the conversation yeah, and it, I'm sort of like the blockage. It gets, it's it not gets allowing it to happen. Um, it gets people things moving. Yeah. That reminded me of a really cute story about Reed who is nine now and, and a good conversationalist, but in the past has, we'd be like in a group setting and he'd want to dominate. Like he'd want to talk to Brian, his, my husband the whole time about something. And Brian's trying to like mingle. And so yeah. we would try to teach him to like <laughs> bring up a topic that, maybe wasn't um, about Pokemon or Magic the Gathering. Like that was about something that like a broader group. And so one time we were sitting at, I think like a family lunch and Reed goes, what is everyone's favorite natural disaster? And we were like, oh, it sparked the best <laughs> conversation, probably like top 10 conversations of the last 10 years, because we got into this whole thing. Like, is it your favorite natural disaster? Is it the one you would like least like to be in, like, does this count? And then everyone went around the table and talked about like their pick for the number one natural disaster. And like those that when you were talking I about like that. bring up eighties TV jingles, like there, the world provides material and kids can actually be great for that kind of thing. You yes. just have to, you have to be like Reed and recognize that they're not going to want to talk about Pokemon. You're not going to get what yes. you're looking for but you can get eight people of different ages to talk for 30 minutes about natural disasters. I love that. They're, like the world is so full of material. You're so right. And there is so much bizarre and awkward and absurd <laughs> things that you could talk about. That just as an aside reminds me, I think that Owen and Reed, we've talked about yes. some, some things in common. And uh, on my Facebook memories the other day popped up from when last, not last time we went to Florida, but maybe Owen was like nine or 10. So we're on a plane and he turns to the guy next to him and says, uh, Oh, hey, I'm just reading up on what to do in the case of a water landing. <laughs> so anyway, have you watched Lost? <laughs> and so he and the guy got in this car. It was the funniest thing because he brings up like plane crashes before the so plane takes funny. off and then brings up a TV show about a plane crash. Oh, but, my gosh. And did it was yes. like, did he have the right audience? Was the guy like, did the guy humor him? I think and the guy thought it was really funny and oh. they talked about Lost for a few minutes. Oh. But it was it was so funny because like. It was so straightforward and frank of him. He wasn't so trying to yeah. start. He wasn't trying to be a great conversationalist. He just said something super random. It's so funny. And it worked. <laughs> so. um, well, I was going to offer as my last tip that if your holidays include conversations that are tense or mm. maybe political in nature or things where you are having to work really hard to be diplomatic and keep feelings from bubbling up, just want to offer that like, we need physical and mental breaks from those yes. types of situations. And so you can be a great conversationalist. Um, I listened actually recently to Sarah and Beth from Pantsuit Politics do an interview on coffee and crumbs. So like podcast worlds colliding. Um, and I have heard them. I mean, we know them and I've heard them speak before, but this was just a recent reminder of how challenging it is um, to go into family conversations where people are, if things are loaded, people are not saying things or they're saying things and there's right. a lot of emotion behind it. So you get to give yourself a break from those. Yeah. You get to let off steam by venting to your husband or sending texts to your best friend. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe these people. Um, and you can play the mom card. You can go nurse yes. the baby. That's one of the advantages. So um, don't, don't feel like you have to be a part of all of those, like every minute of those types of conversations. If you need to excuse yourself, you are given permission. You are. And that's like, you got to take the benefits along with yeah. the, the hard stuff. Um, on that note, I guess one of the things, and I, I, I love conversation. I love talking to people. Um, and one of the things that I tend to do is to have opinions about lots of things that are non-threatening things. <laughs> so I will have opinions like strong opinions about things that other people haven't really bothered to form an opinion about, or like where the stakes are really low because no one cares. Yeah. Like those are the kinds of things I will throw an opinion out about. And then it's not like, and I think you're wrong. It's more like, gosh, have you ever thought that X, Y, and Z, or it seems to me that blah, blah, blah. And then the other person might go, well, I haven't really thought about that, but no, here's how I see it. And then we have a great conversation. And because it's not, you know, the presidency yeah. or the election or um, a political party or religion. And I do talk about religion with people, but man, you got to like, <laughs> you got to skirt that pretty yeah. hard. There's ways to have opinions about things in a way that doesn't threaten anybody, but still makes for interesting conversation. And it, I think it, it takes practice. It takes a lot of empathy. Um, storytelling is a great way to do that because then it's really about you mm -hmm. or this person you saw and not about what you think mm -hmm. of the person in front of you. Um, and I just think those are things that like anybody can get 
better at than they are at now. Mm -hmm. I I don't know that everyone's going to can become naturally great at it, but like anybody can be a little bit better. Yeah. uh, Including both of us. Yeah. Well, and I think sometimes we're trained not to have strong opinions uh, um, (laughs) or to avoid. And so I love what you're saying that it's, it's actually great material for conversation to have a very passionate opinion about something that matters very little, like, you know, it's just, yeah. How do you feel about bananas? Do you like them slightly green or slightly freckly? Like discuss. I, yes. And I totally will disagree with you, like, you know, to the death uh, (laughs) about your opinion about bananas, but um, I've been reading a lot of Jane Austen lately and it does remind me of like, when conversation, like when the art of conversation was so specific, Mm -hmm. like, and there were certain things you did not bring up, not because people shouldn't talk about them, but because in mixed company, often it just ends up going south. Mm -hmm. And there, there's, so there's like the approved topics and then you have nothing else to do, but talk because there's no TV. So you better get really good Mm -hmm. at discussing sort of what we would call small talk now, but like big small talk. Yeah. Yeah. In depth, small talk. So, yeah. And you were expected to, to have, um, like a polished stance on a number of different key, you know, topics. Yes, exactly. We can learn a little bit from people in the 18, the 18th century, but I love it. Probably not everything. (laughs) Well, did we solve it? I don't know. Hopefully for Aaron's sake, Aaron, let us know if we solved it for you. I feel like if you have four kids, six and under, you get to really do whatever you want this holiday season. Exactly. But you if, get a pass. Yes. And I think what she wants is to have good conversation. So I think that's, that's where it came from. And I loved that yep. question. Absolutely. Okay. So we're going to wrap up, but we want to um, let you know about some exciting things happening this week. And that is three more episodes. What? Three. I know. Can you believe it? <laughs> Yes, because we've Sarah worked hard panicked. on them. She's like, what do you mean? Three more episodes. They're done, Sarah. They're yeah, already we did them. The, we did them already. Um, we are doing a special series on creating holiday memories. Uh, it's three shorter episodes that are going to drop tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, we like to try new things during the holidays. And so this is one of the ways that we decided to shake things up and give you all some like more bite-sized content that you can spread out through your week. So come along with us and let us know what you think of this series. Again, it's starting tomorrow and there'll be a new episode uh, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday of this week. And they're a little shorter than the usual episode, but they will all be on the same theme, which is creating holiday memories. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. It was really fun. And, you know, we're we're hundreds of episodes into doing this. So it's fun for us to do things a little differently. Um, and we get so many great ideas from you guys about holiday content. So this is just the kickoff, um, but it doesn't affect anything about our Tuesdays or our Sundays. So, um, yeah, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week, and let us know what you think about those. Um, also all month long, we have been sharing little conversations with, um, the people and the businesses who make our podcast possible through working with us on various aspects of the business. And one aspect of the business that you and I really have no prior experience in, Megan, is finance and accounting. And yep. so in just a minute, at the very end of the, today's episode, you're going to hear my conversation with Morgan Foley. She is a CPA. She is our, I like to call her our, sometimes I call her our CFO. Sometimes I call her our finance and accounting department. She's also our bookkeeper. She keeps the books um, and she's awesome. And she's also a mom of a toddler. So thanks to Morgan. I mean, seriously, thanks to Morgan for everything yes, she's done with everything. us the last couple of years. Um, and it'll be fun to hear from her in just a little bit. So stay around for that. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. As a reminder, when you subscribe to the podcast, you will get a little notification every time a new episode drops. And like tomorrow, when we launch that special series on creating holiday memories, Might be nice if you're subscribed because then you'll know when it drops and the next episode and the next and you won't accidentally forget about it. So hit subscribe wherever you're listening. And thanks again for listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Hey, guys, it's Sarah, and I am back here with Morgan Foley. Hey, Morgan. Hi. So for those who don't know, which is most of you, Morgan works behind the scenes um, on our finance and accounting department. I say it like that, like it's a big department. Morgan is our (laughs) finance and accounting department. And all month long, we are kind of introducing you listeners to some of the people who help make the show possible. Um, And Morgan is a huge part of our business behind the scenes. And also fun fact, Morgan is a real life friend of my sister. So that's how we met. Um, And you are also a mom of a toddler. So maybe Morgan, just tell everybody where you live and who's in your family. Yeah, sure. My husband, Robbie, and I have a two and a half year old son named Rory. And we are both accountants, a little fun fact about us, (laughs) and live outside of Denver in a little suburb 
Denver, Colorado. Nice. And Rory is the cutest, cutest little guy. And also I love the name Rory. It was on my short list for Reed. So it's like a little special connection there. Um, So you are an accountant, as is your husband. And since we've known you and been working with you, um, your full-time work has ebbed and flowed a little bit. But why don't you tell us what's your what's your day job right now? Sure. Yeah. So my prior experience and what I currently do for my day job is working for big publicly traded companies in accounting and reporting. Okay. I don't even know what that means. Like for a lay person. So you go to work for a publicly traded company in their in-house, in-house accounting department. Yeah, exactly. So I work for, yep. An in-house accounting department and specifically what I specialize on is helping with reporting. So sometimes that's, internal reporting where we might be delivering financial statements or reports to upper management to help them make big decisions about their company and their operations. Another big part of what I do is help with certain external reporting requirements okay. that big companies have. Like audits, like that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, exactly. I assist with big audits and ultimately what comes out of audits if you're a publicly traded company, which means you actually trade stock and mm-hmm. you can buy stock in this company. Um, you have to file annual and quarterly financial statements with the Securities and Exchange Commission in Washington. So I actually prepare and help with the audit or help the auditors get through it and then ultimately publish those reports with the SEC. So you live in Excel, basically. Yes, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, I think that is actually fascinating to me because I know so little about especially big companies. But what I do know so much more about than I used to is the finance and accounting of owning a small business. And this is where you came in. So just a little background. um, We brought you in. It's almost two years, right? Was it like early 2018? Does that sound right? I think that's exactly right. Um, And it was like a cry for help. Like we, Megan and I had been officially in business long enough and making a little bit of money long enough to need to pay taxes in, you know, for the 2017 year. And I had had QuickBooks on my computer and like, I'm a smart person and I'm actually pretty good at math. Um, and I just could not like get QuickBooks to sync up with our bank accounts. And Megan had been a solo entrepreneur for years. She'd used QuickBooks. Like we just felt like it shouldn't be this hard. And it was very discouraging. And I do not like to not be able to figure something out. Like usually with enough time and wrestling, I can teach myself something. And it was very humbling because I just thought I am not going to teach myself bookkeeping or QuickBooks or small business accounting. And I brought you on to like bail me out basically. Like, can you fix our QuickBooks? (laughs) And you did. And you were so patient with us. But one thing I think it would be interesting for listeners to hear about is, um, and now uh, to finish that story, you have been working with us now on a more regular monthly basis, a few hours a month, just keeping the books making sense, answering all of my questions. And and then you help more uh, Megan and I, when we are doing more strategic planning to, um, you know, pull reports and kind of analyze the data. And so it's been amazing. And we're so thankful to have you on board. But what I would love to hear you talk about is the learning curve for you in going from big companies and public accounting to helping little old us with like really grassroots, like startup, small business accounting. Yeah, definitely. So first of all, I I remember so clearly when, as you mentioned, I am really good friends with your sister Mm -hmm. and what she had approached me first and said, Hey, my sister, Sarah might need some help on the mom hour, (laughs) which I've listened to for years. Is that something you'd be interested in? No pressure. And of course I just jumped at the opportunity and told her, yes, send her all my info. That sounds great. Um, So I was super excited when you called and needed help and uh, gave me the chance to kind of dive in and see what was going on. You know, I think a big thing that's different is having the opportunity to see on the other side, work directly with an owner of a business and somebody that's more operationally minded. So when you're working in a really big company, Generally, unless you're the CFO of that company, the person you're reporting to is also going to be in an accounting finance role and super right. focused on only the numbers. And our job is to make sure the numbers are correct. And then the, that upper management person will ultimately feed that to operations. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of putting on my small business cap and, you know, you providing me with the opportunity to work with you and have calls with you and Megan and think more on the operational side. 
has been a learning curve for me, but really fun for me. Cause I, I find that side of the business really interesting too, especially in what you guys do. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like cutting out 20 layers yes. right? and, yep. and just getting right to, um, yeah, we've had great, like, it's been great over the couple of years to figure out how best to work together. My favorite story about you, Morgan, is that when we were learning, when we were getting QuickBooks really to be really helpful, a helpful tool for our business, you would just voluntarily get on the phone with QuickBooks support. And like, <laughs> you're like, so I was talking to QuickBooks again and I, I met a friend on the support team. I talked to him for an hour and a half and I was like, Morgan, you don't really have to do all this. Like, just like, it's okay. But you and I are similar in that we like to understand how things work and we like to be thorough. Um, and so the amount of time you and I have spent wrestling with our QuickBooks is just it's a very special memory for me. It is. Yes. <laughs> it evolves. It evolves. And it has come so far. Yep. Um, well, switching gears, um, what are you, what's your little family up to this holiday season? And what are you most looking forward to as a mom of a toddler this holiday season? Oh, so much. <laughs> I've already been thinking ahead to Christmas. I think Rory is really at an age Last year, he was a little, I guess, a little over 18 months. So okay. now being a very verbal toddler that remembers things mm-hmm. and, and all of that, everything from the traditions that, you know, thinking about what we want to try and cultivate this year that he was a little too young for in mm-hmm. previous years and traditions going forward um, is really exciting to me. And then I think even just the excitement of Christmas morning and all of that. Yeah. Um, will be, he's, he's at an age where it's going to feel really fun kind of out of that baby phase. Oh, totally. Um, yeah. And we actually, my husband is from Houston and I am from Northern Michigan. So we alternate each year, whether we go, where we go for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Okay. So, um, gearing up for travel plans like every year, which, which yeah. is always fun. Yeah, no. And, and having all of those extended families see like a kid who's a whole six months or a whole year older than last time is so fun. I always feel like you get a few like freebie years as a mom because they really don't remember anything. I mean, I say it all the time, but I think when kids are five, they remember the Christmas they were four. When they're four, it's really like, it's, it's very iffy if they're going to remember much from the Christmas they were three. So you have a long time to wear like your trying on different approaches and traditions. And in some ways it's kind of like depressing because you're like, I did all this work and you don't remember, but I actually think it's also kind of, it's kind of nice. Like they don't hold you to anything until they're about five. And then from then on, you better, you know, you better know what's going on because they will remember and hold you to your uh, traditions. Absolutely. I remember a more experienced mom with older kids had told me when I was feeling all this pressure for Rory's first Christmas, kind of thinking like, I'm the new mom. This is it. Right. First time having Christmas, a baby yeah. at Christmas. Don't mess it up. <laughs> she said, don't worry. He's so young. He won't know what's going on yet. Yep. No pressure this year. Yep. So, yep. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for all of the, all of the festivities. Well, I think it's really fun. Two and a half is super fun. Well, thank you for coming on and chatting with us. And thank you for everything you do at the Mom Hour. We could not be more grateful. We just love having you on our team. Of course. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or use code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash the mom hour. Hey everyone, Sarah here. Megan and I would absolutely love it if you hit pause right now, right where you're listening and left the mom hour a rating and review. If our show has helped you feel a little more confident as a mom or a little less alone, that's one of the absolute biggest ways you can thank us. And it really takes about 30 seconds. If you're listening in Apple Podcasts, just navigate to the Mom Hours show listing. So not the episode you're listening to right now, but the kind of landing area for our show as a whole. And then scroll down to leave a rating or review. Thank you so much. 